Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Elizabeth Fontana. Um, I'm one of the neurosurgeons at Northwell. Um, I should I just give my background? I'm not sure what. I yeah. think so. Okay, great. So um, I'm originally from Massachusetts. Uh, I went to college at Harvard, and then I came to New York um, to Columbia for medical school and residency. And um, I went out to Seattle for one year after that to do a tumor fellowship, and then I came back. So, and I've been in New York since, ever since, um, at Northwell. And I have been in practice since 2015, I guess. So, go ahead. Go we ahead, got slides Lana. up, by the way, just as an update. So you guys take it away. <laughs> ready um, to go. Should, should we start keep introducing ourselves? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Soraya Motavala. Uh, I am a, actually originally from Canada. I went to McGill University for undergrad and I moved to the US uh, and went to medical school in Indiana, um, which was lovely. And that's where I really became inspired um, to become a neurosurgeon. Uh, I uh, completed my residency at Mount Sinai in New York, um, where I met my current partner in neurosurgery, Ramit Galad, who you're gonna meet in a second. Um, after uh, my residency, uh, I stayed on at Mount Sinai as an attending. I was there as an attending um, at Mount Sinai Beth Israel uh, and Mount Sinai Brooklyn and uh, what is now Mount Sinai West, which was the old Roosevelt Hospital. Uh, and then uh, three years ago, I was approached by Northwell to um, join the team with uh, Dr. Langer and Dr. Pokhar and all these under other wonderful neurosurgeons. And uh, I've been practicing in Staten Island uh, and in uh, Lower Manhattan ever since. Hi, I'm, I'm Roni Gilad. Um, I finished, uh, well, I was born in Israel, but I came to the United States as a child. And um, I uh, did my residency at Mount Sinai where I met Soraya Motavala and we've been friends ever since and still work together. Uh, finished my residency in 2009 and was an attending neurosurgeon in the US Navy uh, for four years. And uh, subsequently after that, I uh, partnered up with Dr. Motivala uh, to be an attending at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in Mount Sinai, Brooklyn. And uh, then we were approached by Northwell to uh, come join the neurosurgery team at Staten Island University Hospital. And uh, that's where we met our third woman partner who you'll meet. Ami Raval, who's sitting right next to me. And so I am really honored, really honored. This is the, the best moment of my career to have two female partners in neurosurgery who are pretty badass. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Ami Raval. I am originally from New Jersey, uh, went to medical school in New Jersey at Rutgers Medical School. I subsequently uh, completed my neurosurgery residency uh, at Tufts University in Boston. And then I came back to the New York area to do my tumor fellowship at uh, Northwell at North Shore University Hospital. And then subsequently I was recruited uh, to be at Staten Island University Hospital. And that's where I've been for the last six years. Um, and this is how I met uh, Dr. Galat and Dr. Motivala after they joined. So this is, uh, this is I'm, I'm excited about this talk. So thank you for inviting me. Okay, <clears throat> um, we are, I guess, missing Dr. Ullman, who was supposed to be a panelist. I'm here. Uh, is in the oh, there she oh, is. Okay, Hi. I'm behind the mask. Hi, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm happy, I'm happy to be here for as long as I can. We have a surgery uh, going on, and they're in the process of uh, doing the anesthesia. I'm Jamie Ullman. I'm a neurosurgeon over at North Shore University Hospital. I'm partners with Elizabeth, Soraya, Renit, and uh, Ami, and uh, we I've. I've been in neurosurgery now for a very long time. 
I graduated from the Mount Sinai uh, School of Medicine Residency Program after graduating from Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. And uh, then I stayed on as a faculty member for about 17 years and then moved over to Northwell about uh, over six years ago. And I've been uh, the director of neurotrauma here at the uh, our level one trauma center in Manhasset. And uh, I've worked very closely in the past with um, all of you, uh, all of the other panel members, and I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> okay, so I guess we'll uh, start our little talk, um, a very quick talk about women in neurosurgery. And, uh, and as an aside, our very own Dr. Allman, who you've met, hopefully not for too briefly, um, is a very important part of the history of women in neurosurgery in this country. Um, and we'll sort of delve into that a little bit as we go. So I titled my talk, which I gave a couple of years ago at a diversity seminar, um, Women in Neurosurgery Less Than a Minority. And I know that sounds very negative. Um, you know, it's a little bit factual. Uh, we have not represented a significant portions of uh, the neurosurgical community. What is the positive at the end of the talk is you can see that that is changing. Um, and just the fact that there are um, five women in uh, the neurosurgery practice at Northwell is a, is a very significant part of, of that change. Uh, historically in, in programs, it, it was, uh, you know, astronomical to see one woman present, one woman faculty member. So, uh, and we are all very gratified as we see more and more women uh, entering residency and uh, we are able to mentor them through residency. Um, so it, it is a story that is heading towards the happy ending and that, and that, that does uh, fill me with joy. So go on to the next slide, please. So I uh, wanted to start the, the talk a little bit looking uh, historically at um, women who have really affected or been responsible for um, the rest of us who are now here. <clears throat> there are really two women who are sort of arguably the founders of uh, women in neurosurgery. Um, one is uh, Sofia Ionescu. She was born in 1920 in Romania. Uh, she uh, was able to enter the Faculty of Human Medicine in Bucharest, where she did her training from 1939 to 1945. It was in her fifth year of medical school um, uh, when she was rotating at the neurosurgical unit of what was called the Central Hospital for Mental, Nervous, and Endocrine Disease in Bucharest in 1933, where sort of uh, some of her skills, uh, potential skills as a neurosurgeon uh, were discovered. Um, it is thought that she performed her first cranial neurosurgery as early as 1944. But 1954 was the time uh, that uh, she became a specialist in her own right in neurosurgery. We could go to the next screen. So she had a decisive moment in her career. Um, and I think later we can open it up or even now to the panelists to talk about um, decisive moments in their career or what may have changed their, them into pursuing neurosurgery. Um, so she was a student under the tutelage of a professor named Dr. Bagdasar. And uh, one day he was unable to operate um, due to a wound on his finger. And because of that, she had to perform uh, the cranial surgery that saved an eight-year-old boy's life. He had something called an epidural hematoma. It was compressing his brain. And she was the only one who could operate, and she did. And the professor was so impressed with her surgical skills um, that he became her leading mentor and offered his support through the incidency of her career. And that is a theme that I think is very important for women in neurosurgery is finding someone to encourage and mentor you through your career. Um, I, I, for me, that's what's allowed me to be successful. I had Dr. Allman. Uh, I had my partner, Dr. Galad. These are people who really pushed me and encouraged me. And I think we'll talk about how that um, is the case with uh, other women in this career. Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to comment now or wait till the end. Wait we'll keep end. going. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> next slide. If we could go on to the next slide. Josh? <laughs> is, it not, is it not moving? It's showing me that it moved. No, it's not moving. Oh, there we go. OK. Oh, that was odd. Um, so Sophia uh, was able, had a career that spanned 47 years. Uh, she was the head of uh, the tumor program and the spinal pathology program. Over that time period, she is recognized as having um, you know, pioneered technical advancements, 
a significant amount of academic research. Um, she was also a, a wife and she was a mother of two children. Um, so she was able to have a family life and an extensive career, which I think is also an important theme uh, for us going forward. Next slide. The uh, other neurosurgeon, uh, female neurosurgeon, who's also accredited with being one of the pioneers or the first um, in neurosurgery was uh, Dr. Diane Beck. She was an English neurosurgeon. Um, she established the neurosurgery service in Middlesex, England. Uh, she had a 31 year career and she was the only female neurosurgeon in Western Europe and the United States throughout her career. Next. In uh, the U.S., Dr. Ruth Kerr Jacoby uh, was the first woman to ever become a diplomat of the American Board of Neurological Surgeons, and that did not happen until 1961. Um, and the American Board of Neurological Surgeons has uh, been around since the early 1900s, so it, it took a good almost 30, 40 years before they admitted a woman in their ranks. Next slide. Dr. Alexa Kennedy was the first African-American uh, female neurosurgeon to become board certified. Uh, she did not um, graduate from her uh, residency until 1981. So you see these huge lapses, uh, long time periods between um, advancement of women. Um, I thought she had an excellent quote um, about becoming a, not just a woman neurosurgeon, but a, a black woman neurosurgeon. Uh, she said, I was worried that because I was a black woman, any practice opportunities would be limited. By being patient-centered, the practice growth for me was exponential. That's a great quote. Just being the person she was and doing an excellent job led to her success, regardless of all the obstacles in front of her. Next slide. So where are we today? Um, I think for women in medicine in general, and then also in neurosurgery, we've come a long way. In 1965, uh, women represented only 9% of medical school enrollees. Now, it's about 50-50 split between men and women, and in some classes, um, the number of women exceeds the number of men. We are still kind of got a bit of a lull in neurosurgery. Um, women represent about 16% of all neurosurgical re residents and about 6% of all board-certified board neurosurgeons. Board certification is sort of the ultimate um, goal at the end of training as you become an attending. It's a comprehensive exam and it's very important in this country to be board certified. Um, what is interesting, you can see that we had uh, very few numbers of women who were uh, ABNS certified on the graph on the right um, over many, many decades. And then since um, the 90s, we've seen some exponential growth in the number of women neurosurgeons who are board certified. So certainly while the numbers are low, they're growing steadily and that's very, very exciting. One of the issues in uh, neurosurgical training is the attrition rate of uh, women residents as compared to men. The attrition rate uh, for female residents in neurosurgery is 17% compared with 5% of their male counterparts. And that, that is a concerning number that of the women who do finally attain admission to neurosurgical programs, a larger portion of them are not finishing. And that is concerning. Next slide. So, you know, we have to take a critical look at ourselves as neurosurgeons. What are we doing wrong? How can we attract more women to neurosurgery residencies and neurosurgical training? How can we ensure that they have success and are able to finish their programs? How can we ensure that they become board certified um, and uh, have successful careers? Um, we've had a few issues in neurosurgery uh, with that. One has been there have been few women in leadership positions, and we'll take a look at that. Um, there is a lack of workplace flexibility, a lack of affordable chi available childcare, and I think that's something that affects women in all careers, but including being a working resident. Um, financial disparities between men and women, which are very real to this day. And then there are antiquated attitudes towards the extensive contributions of women in the workforce. And that is across many professions, but also significant in neurosurgical training. Next slide. So uh, there have been few women in real positions of leadership in academic neurosurgery. Um, over all the years of neurosurgery, we've only had two um, uh, female chairs of neuros academic neurosurgical departments. Uh, up until very recently, it was only one, Dr. Corinne Maraska, and she was joined by Dr. Linda Liao, who is now the chair at UCLA. 
um, that these are, you know, it, that this is a very obviously small number of women who've been able to attain these ranks. Next slide. There are very few uh, full professors of neurosurgery. It's an academic distinction. Uh, it's a recognition of all the hard work, both clinically and academically. I am uh, made a huge lapse. Uh, I do not have a photo of our very own Dr. Jamie Ullman, who's also attained the rank of full professor, which is an incredible feat in neurosurgery um, and even more incredible for uh, the women in our ranks. Next slide. We've only ever had one female president of our professional societies. There's two uh, major professional societies in neurosurgery, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and the Congress of Neurological Surgeries, Surgeons. Um, these societies have been around for 70 and 90 years, respectively. Um, Dr. Shelley Timmons was the first president of female president of the AANS. Uh, Dr. Allman was the first female vice president of the, of the CNS. Um, and, and those have been um, really represented the only true uh, leadership at this level uh, for women. And that's, you know, like I said, combined total of about 90 years of, uh, of uh, professional uh, neurosurgical societies. Next slide. Um, lack of workplace flexibility, lack of affordable available childcare, uh, you know, something that affects uh, women in all careers. Most uh, female neurosurgeons felt that would have been impossible historically to have children in residency. Um, there have been some improvements in attitudes and support, but it's still incredibly difficult. Maternity leave remains six to eight weeks in most institutions. Um, there are 80 hour work week requirements for graduation, uh, lack of support for the time space for breastfeeding, pumping, you know, emergencies with children. Women in medicine, on average, incur 20 more hours a week of parenting than their male counterparts. That's 20 hours that you don't have to devote um, to academic research, uh, to uh, clinical medicine, um, and that does affect um, your chances for advancement. Uh, low resident salaries are very prohibitive to getting um, acceptable child care for your child should you have a child in residency. There are very few, if any, on-site funded childcare facilities in hospitals. Next slide. There is financial inequality, um, even for women neurosurgeons. On average, female neurosurgeons are paid about $90,000 a year less for this, at the same level as their male counterparts. This is true in other medical specialties, vascular surgery, and even in cardiology. Um, and there's also financial inequalities between women of different races, which I couldn't find data on, but we know is the case uh, in the workplace at large. Next slide. So attitudes towards women and by women in neurosurgery have been slow to change. Discrimination uh, against women in neurosurgery has taken many forms over the years. Uh, simple things like comments and questions that are only asked of women during their um, interview process, either for residency or for a job. Uh, famous questions like, how are you gonna take care of your child? Or are you planning to have children? This is never asked of our male counterparts. Um, you know, we are exposed to sexist remarks about coworkers or patients um, being passed over for jobs or, um, or positions has often been something that we've seen. And there's certain amounts of implicit bias. Uh, women in neurosurgery have often tended, and in medicine in general, and in other careers have uh, often tended uh, to have some sense of imposter syndrome because of all this, that you don't really belong there, that people are gonna realize that you don't belong there. Um, and, and this leads, to, there are differences between the way women and men behave in the workplace, and neurosurgery is no exception. Women are more likely to point out their own flaws, uh, underrate themselves on self-assessments, and express their fears. And that sort of um, self-insight, um, thoughtfulness, is seen as possibility of being weak or of uh, incompetence. Um, and, uh, and that is, you know, or, or just, you know, non-confidence uh, is not an attitude that neurosurgeons are supposed to have, quote unquote. Next slide. What's interesting is those uh, same things that are seen as flaws. Uh, a huge study came out in JAMA very recently that those traits of introspection, of uh, questioning oneself, of striving to improve, uh, actually um, is a trait in female physicians that allows them to take better care of patients that has led to like lower readmission rates in hospitals and mortality in hospitals. 
um, the attitude towards this sort of personality does have to change. Next slide. One of the um, important things is our professional societies in neurosurgery are starting to realize that this is an issue, uh, looking at it um, with introspection and discussing ways that we can move forward and improve. In 2017, the ANS, our professional society, came out with an entire paper looking at the rising number of women neurosurgeons um, over the years. What they found was um, over 50 years at uh, the time of this publication, 2017, they had had 379 women matriculate for neurosurgery residencies, which is overall very low when you consider the number of men, but was a growing number. 70% of those women became ABNS certified. It was about 50-50, which is equivalent to men of going into academic versus private practice. Overall, they did find that um, women were attaining fewer leadership positions in neurosurgery, and that was discussed as being a problem. Um, it was very seminal that this came out because it meant that we were talking about it, we were looking at it, and we were thinking about ways to improve it. And prior to around this time period, I don't think those discussions were really at the forefront. Um, and so that's the part that gives me hope is that we see more and more women join our, joining our residency programs. We see more and more women slowly but surely attaining positions of authority. Um, and uh, you know, we can see that things are changing. There are more, when you are in a program now, there are more women mentors for you to get advice from and to help you grow your career. And that really wasn't the case 20, 30 years ago. Um, so I think I'm gonna, at that point, leave off and uh, let the rest of the panel discuss. Can you hear me? Yeah. Th thank you. Do you want me to open the chat function so that people can ask you questions? Sure. Sure. Great talk, Dr. Motovala. Thanks, Dr. Amazing, Galad. Amazing talk. I think the, the importance of leadership positions for women and mentorship is, is so important to talk about and, and we can do better. We can do better. Um, I was so fortunate to be in a residency program at the time that had two uh, very accomplished women neurosurgeons, Dr. Isabel Germano and Dr. Jamie Ullman, both very accomplished in, in so many ways, mothers who I looked up to. And uh, I, I think that kept me going. Um, so the, the importance of having a role model is just not, not to be underestimated. And I, I think we need to do better there. Dr. Fontana, what was your experience with uh... mentorship? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, there weren't really any um, women on the faculty at Columbia, um, and so my mentor during medical school. Well, we had a, there's he's now retired, a fellow named Don Quest, who um, really was a enormous champion for women um, in neurosurgery. And even as a medical student, he was very encouraging. And throughout my residency, he was very supportive the entire time. It made a huge difference. Um, there really wasn't a lot of support. And, um, and you know, to be, I'm sure Jamie maybe had a similar experience at some point, I, or I don't know, all of you perhaps, you know, to be the only female for, you know, almost all the time, um, it, it's quite lonely and it's a, it's quite a difficult experience. And so anybody can be a good mentor, male or female. I mean, it's obviously preferable to have someone that can really relate to what you're experiencing. Um, and when I went into, when I was in Seattle, uh, there was a woman, um, her name is Sarah Falk. She was amazing. She trained at WashU um, and she uh, was incredibly supportive. And it was, a, it was like, it was like the lights had been switched on really. It was the first time I ever had a mentor who was female and she had children, she had a family and, um, you know, we could socialize outside of, out of, outside of work, which is which all of my colleagues had, you know, would do normally. And I thought, you know, in, in sort of this like boys club kind of way. And, and it was, uh, it was so eye opening to sort of see the flip side of what that experience 
is like um, because it had I just hadn't had it so um, I think there's a lot of questions about um, about being a mother and a neurosurgeon if anyone wants to talk about that I'm seeing those scroll past very quickly Maybe we could all just sort of address the question. You think, so, right? Maybe we should all just say our sure. experience. Sure. Yeah. So, Jamie, do you want to start, perhaps? Because you look like well, you're about to grab. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think, um, you know, thanks for the talk, Soraya. I think it's just very important. Um, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of these questions that are popping up here and, and being mothers. And there was one question that struck me as, I'm, as it's all flashing in front of me <laughs> as to if the odds are against us, why do it? And I, I think that, um, let me just try to address that because I think that's probably running through the minds of many of the participants on this um, conference. I think that um, sometimes we as individuals make a decision in the course of our, our pathway towards a career to travel on, on roads. And everyone knows the Frostbaum, you know, the, the road less traveled by. And, and what, what the road for neurosurgery is a very interesting road, but it's certainly one that's not been trampled on too much and certainly not by women. And I think that um, you first have to go with your interest. And in my case, I didn't initially in medical school have a neurosurgery residency program to uh, interest me. I, I basically hooked on to a neurosurgeon that was there, no women at all, but I just found interest in the subject and then went forward with it regardless of what the history might be in terms of whether women have had a big role in this specialty or not. My fortune was to actually get admitted to a residency program that had a long history of admitting women into the program. So uh, Leonard Malice was the chairman of our department when I entered at Mount Sinai, and we had multiple women. And he was a pioneer in that respect. I think he, he along with a select few others, were more willing to have women in their programs. And uh, our, I have to say that the Mount Sinai program did not um, have a culture of, of sexism or, or discrimination. That's not the case in other programs. But if you're determined to go into something like neurosurgery, very little is going to hold a person back if they're really passionate about it. Despite even that though, I think it's important for us to have role models and increasingly there are more women. As Soraya said, 15%, uh, more than 15% of women are residents now. And that's going to translate to an increase in the number of total women over the course of time. Do we, have we at all broken through the glass ceiling much? I don't think so. Even with one female neurosurgeon that became the president of the um, AANS, we still haven't really broken through this glass ceiling completely. I'm happy to say that since Soraya put up, uh, made this talk, that there are two more women who are now chairs of academic departments. There's um, Aviva Abash, who's mm -hmm. in Kansas. Um, and then there's uh, Shelly Timmons, who is in um, uh, Indiana. So we have, we're getting there. Are we first and foremost on the minds of the choices of deans looking for chairs? In some parts of the country, yes. They are looking to diversify the academic profile of neurosurgeons, and some places are still not there yet. So the odds are not against us now, 
we need to push forward and make sure that our presence is known, our interest is known, our competency is known. Now, as for being a mother, and I don't want to dominate this uh, panel, but um, as far as being a mother, I have to be honest, I came into it pretty late. I was really hell-bent on getting my career started that I really put off even the dating process. And so it wasn't until after I graduated from residency that I finally went forward and said to myself, gee, I ought to get a husband. So I just <laughs> went ahead and I just, uh, you know, started uh, trying to search. And finally, I actually found a very nice man who's very supportive and, um, and has uh, been able to help in, in raising um, my one child. And I started a little bit late, so I have one child, but I'm very grateful for that one child. She's absolutely beautiful. She's fantastic. And I think that's all I can do right now. <laughs> personally. Uh, but I, I think that's, uh, that's, it, it is, you know, I ha you have to have uh, an ability to be able to balance family life and career. And by no means has anyone mastered that. I, I defy you to have a woman or a man say that I've mastered work-life balance. <laughs> and I think, you know, for, especially for women, because we have the sense that we, you know, we have this caretaker um, sensibility. And that's a lot different from, from some men. And so I think that uh, we, we tend to put so much on to our ourselves. And so therefore, I think that we have to understand that um, it's important to know that you have to, you need support in order to accomplish this. And I think in many cases, uh, the women that do do this have the support needed. And if not, then we have to uh, think about how we're going to get that support. But it by no means should be a deterrent. Um, everyone on this panel is um, a mother, uh, or has a successful personal life, and you can have that both. You can have it all. You just have to know how to parse it out. And we're still going to be trying to achieve the ultimate work-life balance, but I think there is a way to do it. So I'm happy to, uh, you know, that there is so much interest. There's over 1,600, almost 1,700 participants here. And I'm, if you're interested in neurosurgery, by all means, we're here. We can help you see if this is something that you'd like to pursue. I, I remember early on in medical school, and I mentioned that I might want to do neurosurgery. I remember someone telling me, oh, you shouldn't do that. You should do anesthesia. It's a much better career for a woman. And I, exactly what Dr. Ullman said, I thought, but I'm not interested in anesthesia. I just thought neurosurgery was so cool, so fascinating. You know, it, it wasn't hard to work that hard when you like what you do. Right. It, it, even though it was, it was not easy. It was, I'd rather spend a hundred hours a week doing something I love than 40 hours a week doing something I dislike. And, um, that interest, that passion for it really helps you to get past those obstacles. It helps you to figure out how to be, you know, have the things you want outside of neurosurgery as well, while still being able to give so much to your career. Um, and I, I just, you know, if you want to do it, you can do it. If you have a passion for it, you will be successful. Um, and the other parts of your life will come along too. You know, I, I have twin boys. I have a wonderful husband. And I go to work every day and I get to take care of patients in a way that I love and work with amazing people, um, you know, amazing other women neurosurgeons. Uh, and uh, I would not say that it was easy and I would not say that it wasn't without struggle. But anything worth having in this world uh, takes effort. And it takes care. And, and, you know, if you want to do something, you will find a pathway to do it. And I think that's very important. So if I could add to that, I, I think that what we all, besides being women, what we all have in common on this panel is that we love what we do. Um, we love what we do, and we're all good at it. And uh, one of the things that, as a mother, that gives me comfort I'm a mother of two children, is that even though I sometimes miss games, I come home late, my kids know that I love what I do for a living 
and they are very proud of me. And that just makes it easier for me to, to do what, what I do every day and, and go to work every day is I know that they can see that I love what I do and they're very proud of what I do for a living. Yeah, I would just echo that. I think it, it just, it, it's a great job. Um, <laughs> and I think all of us here really, you know, would make the same choice again, despite whatever sacrifices we had to make um, to get here. Um, I remember deciding to become a neurosurgeon. I was, um, I was in medical school and I was shadowing um, somebody and uh, my parents, my mom's a nurse, my parents were very um, convinced that I should go into pediatric cardiology. I have no idea how they picked that, but that's what they wanted me to do. And, uh, <laughs> and so that's kind of like, I, that was what I had kind of in mind. And I was trying various things. I actually did a bunch of ped sub eyes, um, you know, but the first time that I saw neurosurgery, which was earlier in my um, medical school training, um, I just, it was a brain surgery and I saw the brain and I thought, this is so beautiful. Why would I, why would I do something else if I could do this? This is so much cooler than all these other things. And then I went through the process and people just kept telling me, no, no, this is a terrible choice for a woman. You should not become a neurosurgeon. You'll be miserable. And so I kept trying to convince myself actually to do something else. Uh, but I just kept coming back to it. And even though at some point I recognized that although until you're really in it, you don't quite know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, I knew that I was getting into something that was going to be very challenging. But at the same time, I really felt like it was something that was gonna be rewarding for the rest of my life. And the neurosurgeons I knew, who were all male, uh, but they still all seemed to really get an enormous amount of gratification from their career choice. And I, I could see that in various you know, fields, you know, there is burnout in, in medicine. And there seemed to be more enthusiasm, even in the most senior ranks um, in neurosurgery than in some of the other specialties. And to me, that, that also um, really left an impression. But you know, I really think it's such a hard path. And the fact that we still are all so passionate about it really speaks to what a, you know, an incredible career choice it is. Uh, I have two children, um, just to address the mom question. Uh, my oldest child is actually adopted. I adopted her. Uh, both of my children I got, I had, let me see, uh, after residency. Uh, I adopted my child. She was three when I got her. Um, and then I had another child who's biologically mine um, using a donor. And I'm, so I'm a single mom of two children. Uh, one is 19 months and the other is six. It's hard to, to do it all for sure, um, especially um, without a partner, but I have, you know, you find support however you find it. And, um, you know, I have lots of friends. I have, um, I have amazing childcare and it, it hasn't been easy to sort of balance everything by any means, but you know, you can do it, so. So, uh, without echoing what everyone else uh, has said, I actually did not know that I wanted to go into neurosurgery until fairly late in my medical school career. Um, I actually tried to convince myself that surgery was the least uh, uh, enticing specialties that I would go into. And in fact, I did all my surgical clinical rotations early so that I could focus on the more non-surgical rotations. And it wasn't until I was in my neurology rotation where um, I've always had an interest and that's very important. You have to be interested in the basics, in the anatomy, in the, in, in, in the actual um, science um, because that's going to be with you throughout the course of your career. If you're not interested in that, if you're only interested in, you know, becoming, uh, you know, a surgeon or a neurosurgeon, um, that can fade very quickly. So you have to be absolutely interested in the in, in the science of what you want to do. Um, so I was on my neurology rotation and while I loved the neurology and the anatomy, I realized that I was missing that gratification that you get from, from the surgical rotations. And so um, it wasn't towards probably the third year of my medical school 
that I realized that I, I actually really am interested in neurosurgery. And then, you know, the next step was to, to find a mentor and to start the, the application process. And I was very lucky in that I had a male uh, mentor, um, Dr. Michael Shoulder in my medical school, who's always been a great advocate for all medical students. But, you know, I said to him, I said, do you think that I can do this? Do you think that this is a realistic goal? And he was very supportive and he said, yes, absolutely. And, and then I started the application process. Um, but, you know, the key is, is as Dr. Alden and, and all the other women doctors have said, you have to be absolutely interested in the science um, and never lose focus of that. And then the second thing is if you can find a mentor, whether it be male or female, um, just someone that has uh, faith in you is, is, is very important. So. What question should we answer now? Um, there's been uh, questions about imposter syndrome, a lot of questions about dealing with sexism in the workplace. Um, hot topic. Hot topic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a tough one. But, uh, an important one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, so I, I'm not gonna lie, I mean, to, to have done this, and I think a lot of us can speak to this, you have to have a bit of a thick skin. Um, I think that's an understatement. You have to have a really thick skin. Um, but, but I do think that, um, at least within neurosurgery and neurosurgery residency, you know, the attitudes have changed substantially. So what Dr. Allman would have had to have dealt with at the beginning of her career um, you know, all of the, her hard work and her thick skin paved the way for it to be a little bit easier for, you know, at least for me, for my generation, um, you know, but I, it would be disingenuous to say that you don't face sexist attitudes still to this day. But I, I do think I am very hopeful because I, I feel like a lot of um, re male residents now don't have those attitudes. It's the newer generation. Um, and that means the newer generation male attendings don't have those attitudes either. Um, and I find most of my colleagues, my male colleagues, very supportive in this day. And I don't think that was always the case many years ago. I have a story to share uh, about <laughs> sexism. Um, a, a terrific male a colleague or junior resident of mine at Mount, Mount Sinai. Um, we're still really good friends till this day. He's a wonderful, wonderful human being. He is um, a terrific, terrific, very successful surgeon. And uh, when I became chief resident, um, I kept asking him, why don't you scrub in on these cases with me? It'll be great. You know, we can do this together. And uh, he'd find something else to do. And he always scrubbed with my co-resident, uh, my male co-resident. And um, as residency progressed, he scrubbed in more and more with me and we had a great relationship. Fast forward to my residency graduation, he actually stood up, and I'll give him a lot of credit for this. He actually stood up and sp all the residents uh, spoke about the graduating residents and he stood up and he said that I had some hesitation, I had some hesitation to scrub in with you, essentially because you are a woman and I was so wrong about that. You turned out to be one of my greatest mentors. I learned so much from you and I give him a lot of credit for that, that it, it, it gives me hope that even pre-existing attitudes can change, uh, can change with time. And he got up publicly and he said that. So um, that gives me a lot of hope for the future. I think one of the lessons from that is also your work, your integrity, your compassion, you know, your, your education, your intellect, all of that will speak for itself. You know, if you put in the time, if you care, if you do good work, 
you know, the rest will follow. And you just have to block out some of the noise and you go forward on your path. And I, I do think, you know, that was the, the quote from Dr. Kennedy, one of the first African-American neurosurgeons, that her work ended up speaking for herself. And, um, and I, I think that is kind of the lesson for all parts of life and is definitely true in neurosurgery. You want, can I say one thing? Hi. Uh, I just joined while well, I'm watching you guys just keep my mouth shut. But I, I also think that, and I, Ronit and I had an interaction about a month ago that to me resonated. I mean, I feel like I'm as uh, open minded as anybody about this. And um, what taught me is it's important that women say something. That I think there's been a history of having a thick skin and letting it roll off and not being our equals. If I'm upset with what a guy says, I say something. Now, there are a lot of passive aggressive people out there. Don't be passive aggressive, just be aggressive. When you have a problem, confront it. Don't talk behind people's backs, confront the problem. And uh, I was in a meeting, Ronit had some issues with the way that I spoke. I was actually, in, I was actually concerned about interrupting for this exact reason, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what she did was she spoke to me like a professional and an equal and said, Dave, this, was, this wasn't a good idea. And I, it, it resonated with me and I, I wouldn't, wasn't even aware of it. And I think that because, remember, there are cultural biases on both sides. And some men have no real ill will or, or have no, you know, they're, they're, they're feel, I mean, I feel like I'm as supportive as, of women in this business as anyone. Uh, but I made a mistake and Ronit pointed, so Ronit had the, the guts to point it out and I had the openness to realize I could have been better. And so the key I think is open your mouths, you know, don't just, just take it. I mean, I think that a lot of women have done that over the years and men are responsible for some of that for not being open to criticism. And that's something we'll, I think is changing. I think, uh, and I congratulate and, and appreciate Ronit's honesty and, and respect and, and the way she discussed that. That's all I want to say. But that this 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 uh, I'm so glad we're having this meeting. It was one it was just one of the things that I just was really looking forward to and didn't want to miss it. So thank you all for participating. And now I'll take thank my you. video off. <laughs> thank you. Thank there's you, David a, Langer. There's been like a lot of questions regarding like how your interactions with patients differ, or do you think you face a lot of like sexism from patients? If you can, like comment on that. You know, that's actually a very good question because I've I've spanned the gamut. I think when I started my residency was in 19 uh, well, I was an intern in 1989, so now we're talking um, really almost. Was it 40 years? Oh my God, 30 years? No, 30 years, sorry. Of, of a long a long period where, you know, we I've seen attitudes change over the course of time. So patients, uh, some patients Hi. were uncomfortable. And then there are also, um, you know, some cultural, um, there are certain cultures that don't want women to be treating them. But I've seen this evolve over the course of time, and I've seen it uh, change where there are many people now who prefer to have women providers. Uh, maybe it's because we can't be uh, compassionate. And I think that's a very important thing for all of us to understand. I think the attitudes of patients have changed in the last uh, years and have uh, evolved so that more people are uh, willing and, um, and ex not only willing and accepting, but desire um, female care providers. Anyone else have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we still get, and I'm sure that Dr. Galad and, and the rest of the panel, uh, we still get those moments when, when we walk into a patient's room 
and they presume that the male counterpart that we're walking in with is the doctor and they think that we're the assistant uh, or the nurse and you know uh, I don't know how the rest of the panel uh, addresses that or responds to that but you know the best thing to do is to is to be confident and um, and to be you know assured of who you are and say nope this is my name is Dr. Raval and I am your surgeon. And, and usually the patients will respond with that with, oh, okay, well, you know, uh, I apologize. So, you know, the key is to, is to be confident in who you are and how accomplished you are um, and, and not back down. Um. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just echo, I think, you know, I don't notice it on a day-to-day -day basis per se all that often, um, you know, certainly on occasion when I get mistaken as like the more junior person and when I walk into the room um, with, you know, a male resident or something. Um, I do notice also that the patients on, in general tend to be a little less formal. Um, there's much more of an inclination to, part of it may also just be the times and things, generational changes, but that, you know, I'll be, it'll, they'll be much more inclined to call me by my first name or, um, you know, just generally uh, banter with me in a way that I know they probably wouldn't um, if I was one of, if I looked like one of my senior male colleagues. Um, I, I would just also comment that I do think there is um, some data to support that um, women, um, proceduralists, um, if you go to, like, if a patient goes to see a female proceduralist, they are actually more likely to go get a second opinion. Um, and that also the revenue that uh, female proceduralists generate um, is, um, I think, statistically significantly a little bit less than um, their male counterparts. That's not how much they get paid, but how much they actually generate, which suggests they're either doing fewer procedures or they're doing less complicated procedures or whatever the case is. Um, so uh, there are, I think, some uh, objective data that uh, suggests that, that the patient interaction with female physicians, um, and obviously that would include neurosurgeons, uh, is different um, in ways that maybe on a day-to-day -day basis we don't necessarily pinpoint. I do feel just on, on that note, uh, Dr. Fontana, um, I do feel that um, we do have to, uh, till this day, and, and I could be wrong, but we have to prove ourselves more, uh, prove our competency more than the exact male counterpart. And I do feel that it, everyone has complications. Anybody who, who operates has, com, has uh, complications, but I feel that uh, when we have complications, it's, it's a little bit worse than the same complication for our male counterparts and more difficult to, to recover from that. Um, at the same time, and, and I, you know, I hope things change, um, but at the same time, I think it makes us better too. Um, we strive, we have to be better to be just as successful. And, um, and right now, I, you know, hopefully things will change, but uh, right now we have to work harder and be better uh, to, to be as successful. And uh, I, I do feel that, that everyone on this panel has, a, has accomplished that. Our, we're all very successful and uh, we're, we're just as good, if, if not even better than our male counterparts. I do believe that. I think there are some questions, some interesting questions about uh, pay equity and, and arguing for promotions and negotiating. And I think in general, um, women are still shortchanged in terms of pay. And I think this is well documented. So uh, I think this needs to improve by actually addressing uh, women's ability to negotiate 
and uh, and there's a very nice uh, you know consulting team that of two women neurosurgeons that have uh, mm -hmm. built a consulting service to help other women try to help negotiate their contracts with hospitals and, and departments. And I, I think that something like that is needed to help us uh, women try to negotiate the best for ourselves. Um, it, it's it's very important that um, we can break through, but breaking through those barriers requires more education for us and finding those opportunities and seeking them out in order to uh, help us with the negotiation process is really very important. Because I'll tell you, if, 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 uh, if they have an opportunity to pay a woman less, they will. And I think these are the hard realities. And the only way to, and unfortunately, because a lot of salaries are not published and we don't know what our colleagues are making, then that makes it very difficult for us to gauge what, uh, what, uh, what we should be asking for when we're trying to get jobs. On the other hand, you know, there are other ways of trying to find out what average salaries are, and those things are published, but it never, it never accounts for what a particular institution or practice other people are getting within the same practice. So again, um, what, what plays against us is a lack of transparency, but I think we have to move forward and trying to um, fight for ourselves in getting pay and, and equal and, and negotiating um, good deals uh, as good as our male counterparts. I, you know, I think it's so taboo to ask a colleague about their contract, about what they're making. You know, it's, it's such a taboo thing to talk about money. Um, but if you don't talk, if you don't ask, if you don't go, and you know, talk to as many people as you can, um, you're not gonna know what your real value should be. And you will agree to something that is you know, underpaying you. And when you do that, especially for someone who is just starting as an attending, you know, you're kind of just grateful that somebody offered you a job. Um, but if you take that lower end at the beginning, you will always be trying to play catch up. And I think that's very, very important um, you know, you, you, you have to uh, advocate for yourself. And I, I don't know if our male colleagues get the same thing, but I've been in instances where I've been a little bit shamed for standing up for my value, you know, that it's like greedy or all about money. But no, I'm just asking for what my male counterparts get. But they, they it has been like that, that I should just do all the extra call for free because it's a good experience for me while my male, male colleague gets paid for it. Um, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that can happen. And you, and you, it, you know, for a bit, I felt guilty, like, I, you know, maybe I did something wrong standing up for myself. But you have to realize that you have to look out for your interests there um, and use your voice and not let anyone make you feel bad that you are just asking for what you're worth. And, and I think that's also a lesson for any career, honestly, for women. thing I would say is remember who you're talking to you know you have to uh, there's a whole personality you know circle everyone you have to know kind of what your personality is and um, know who the person that you're is, that is recruiting you if you have someone who's a bit misogynistic and classic male you have to be probably a little more forceful with that person you have to gain you can't just be who maybe you are because they're th seeing you through a different prism but uh, if you have someone that's more insightful and more kind of at your level, then you can be more yourself. And that's true as a male too. I, I, you have to look at the person you're talking to and uh, adjust. And that's, that, that's sometimes harder for women because there are just so fewer uh, men who are in leadership positions that are even aware that this is going on. That's changing, but uh, it's important that you recognize that uh, right away when you're getting your jobs. Hey everyone, thank you so much. We're just about out of time. Any final words before we switch over to the next lecture? Thank you for having us, Randy. Thank you for having us. Thank great. you so much. This was yeah. wonderful. And thank you for all the fantastic questions. Yeah. And thank you, David Langer. Thank you for your comments. Thank you.
And we yeah. need more women in neurosurgery. <laughs>